Well, we had been in the book of Hebrews, and we're taking a quick pause. If you could load the, uh, the uh, ones for today, brother, back there, that'd be helpful. We're actually taking a quick pause from our, our marching through the book of Hebrews uh, just to celebrate Christmas uh, specific things for the next couple of weeks, this week, next week, and into Christmas Eve. I don't know about you guys, but my wife and I are suckers for those sappy Christmas movies, the Netflix-type specials. Um, Laura just uh, convinced me to log on to Hallmark. Did you know there was a channel called Hallmark Men? Did you know that was out there? And um, <laughs> opened it up and started kind of swiping through to see how many Christmas movies there were, and the list just kept going and going, and going, and going. I couldn't believe it. But we, we actually do love watching those sappy movies, the kinds that the acting is so bad it kind of makes you cringe, like you, you hope they pull off that next scene before they get to it. We're probably just some of those who help keep them in business, I think, because they do that. This time of year, no matter where we look, people are thinking about and celebrating Christmas. Billboards change. Those little banners that pop up as you're browsing through the websites that pop up. All, all of the emails you get, you didn't even know you were on the lists, somehow start piling in about Christmas sales and specials and get a gift for that special someone and all those kind of things. You hear it on the radio as people talk to you in the, the stores where inevitably are going to be decorated in some fashion, either for winter or for Christmas or for holidays generally. Even the weather, because of where we live, reminds us that there's something new or something we're celebrating distinct. We have no excuse this time of year to not be thinking about our Savior, Jesus. And it's crazy to think about how many people in our country at least, and the world at large, celebrate in some way Christmas. They celebrate December 25th. People who do not in any way profess to be Christians. I'm not even talking about perhaps millions who might say, yeah, sure, I'm Christian, but maybe don't really know and love and honor God. I'm talking about those who would flat out say, I don't believe in this Jesus guy. I don't, might, I might not even believe in God. You know, they celebrate Christmas, which of course is a marker for us to remember the birth of Jesus. So we celebrate and people in the world celebrate. I find it especially ironic as, as I watch through some of these kind of movies and listen to some of the songs, how almost opposite to the story of the gospel some of the worldly Christmas messaging is. It gets me thinking about what, if we're both celebrating the same day, both call it the same thing, what is different about how Christians celebrate Christmas? from the ways that the rest of the world celebrates December 25th. What are we really commemorating this time of year? I'm entitled the sermon today, Why We Celebrate. This is a part one, because we'll continue it into next week and even for our Christmas Eve sermon. I want to begin by praying and then I just want to show you three things from God's Word. I'm going to give you three statements there are ways that we celebrate Christmas that the world cannot. So let's pray and we'll do that. Father, this morning we ask that you help us redeem all of the little cues in our culture that point to Jesus' birth. Father, they could be distractions, gloriously awful distractions that take our mind and our eyes and our heart, our affections off of you. Lord, I pray that you would help us leverage all those things that we see to point them right back to you, that we would be the kind of people who every Christmas light, every ring of a bell, every Christmas tree, every, even every little flurry of snow would make us think about you and what this season really represents. Lord, we need your help with that, not only all the days of December, but we need them even right now as we are preparing to open your word and even listen to this sermon, Lord. Keep our minds, our eyes, and our hearts fixed on you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing that we as Christians celebrate, in no particular order, that the world cannot definitionally celebrate is that we need a Savior. 
Christians, in celebrating Christmas, start with the acknowledgement that we need Christmas, that we need a Savior born into this world. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 2, the prophet of old, hundreds of years before Jesus would be born, said, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. When Jesus was born, he entered into a world of darkness. Now this theme of darkness and light is used all over, not only the Old Testament, but even particularly in the New Testament. The question we might want to ask is, what does Isaiah have in mind here? And even if Isaiah didn't understand, what did the Holy Spirit inspire Isaiah to write about here when he was talking about darkness and light. What is this darkness? It doesn't take us very long to figure out from the scriptures that darkness is referring to sinfulness of the world. The world is dark. The people walked in darkness simply because of sin. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21... It says of Mary, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from... This might be an interesting thing to ask somebody if you're trying to share the gospel this time of year. What is the angel Gabriel in sharing this with Mary? What what is he going to complete that sentence with? She will bear a son. Mary, the virgin Mary will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from... From what? What do you think Jesus came to save his people from? Was it the Romans, the national oppressors, those who were physically holding down the people of Israel? Was it the religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the parties of Jewish leaders who laid heavy burdens on the shoulders of the people and refused to lift them even with a finger, those who were wicked and evil shepherds, and those maybe who might have been well-meaning shepherds and still missing completely, was it legalism Jesus came to save the people from? How about Satan and demons? Is that what Jesus came to save the people from, from demons and from, from Satan, from the deception of spiritual powers? What does Gabriel say? She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. That's what we need to be rescued from. Our own sins. This is one of those things that the Netflix and the Hallmark Christmas specials often seem to share as a common theme. This idea that there's much inherent good in all of us, and at Christmas time is a particularly appropriate time for it to be drawn out of all of us. You know what I'm talking about, that? Goodwill towards men that's kind of expressed. But that's not what God tells us. It's just not the reality of things. Christmas is not the reset time in order to try to re-engage with the good deeds of our own hearts. Proverbs 29 says, Who can say, I have made my heart pure, I am clean from my sin? Solomon will later say, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. So many people know this intuitively. So many people know that they are imperfect people, yet they try to make it seem less severe than it really is. In fact, we say things like, I know I am not perfect, but I'm not a bad person. You heard this? You even thought this of yourself? James 2.10 says, For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. Follow what he's saying there? Whether you break one law or all of them, you're a lawbreaker. And you might say, well, I didn't break that particular one, but you broke another one. Still, some try to outweigh the bad that they've done in their lives with good deeds. So that at the end of the day, they might be able to say, well, I've done mostly good things. Perhaps the picture of the cosmic scale. I've done lots of bad things, but I've done more good to outweigh those bad things. The prophet Ezekiel in the Old Testament said this, that when a righteous person turns away from his righteousness and does injustice and does the same abominations that the wicked person does, 
shall he live? None of the righteous deeds that he has done shall be remembered. So interesting how many people would like to say, well, I lie, but I'm not a liar. I steal, but I'm not not a thief. This would be like the person who's committed a horrible crime and then donated a bunch of money to charity. But look at that. No one's going to remember you for that. That's not what you're going to be remembered by. You're going to be remembered by the wicked deeds. And this is a universal reality, a universal truth for us. And God is saying this for our benefit, that we would know that we could never try to wipe away our own sins by doing future good. It doesn't work that way. Some people feel better by claiming that they are victims of the darkness. I actually think this is highlighted in our modern day. And by modern day, I mean the last several years. Have you sensed this victim language? All over the place. Ephesians 5.8, though, shuts that down pretty quick. Tells us about our past condition. Paul's writing to believers, and he's talking about what we used to be as opposed to what we are now because we've been redeemed. And he says this, For at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. You were darkness. You get that? That's identity stuff. It's not the darkness used to have hold of you. It is you used to be the darkness. You were darkness. The problem is not just that you sin, but that you are a sinner. Some of you will miss this big, giant, critical, and important thing. Sin is not just something we do. Sinner is who we are. You can't separate sin from the sinner by our nature. But couldn't it be said that since we can't control what we inherit, like a sin nature, the darkness, you're born in darkness, into darkness, we commit darkness, shouldn't we then say that we can't really be held morally culpable or morally guilty? Now, even if it could be possible to make that claim, the problem in reality is not just that we live in darkness. It's not just that we are affected by darkness. It's not even that we are the darkness. It's actually worse than that. It's that we want the darkness. It's that we desire the sin. Living in darkness is an act of willful desire. John 3.19 says, And this is the judgment The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. See how John puts that there. Why are people in the darkness? Because they want to be in the darkness. That's why. Why, before you believed in, loved, and desired Jesus, why did you love your sin? It's built into you. Now this does not mean that people want the consequence of the darkness. Because some might argue, no, 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 nobody wants the bad stuff that happens from sin. No, perhaps not. But in spite of the consequences, in spite of all of the warnings, that's the internal warnings, like the conscience given to us as a law etched upon our hearts that we might know what is right and wrong, or external warnings like laws given by God or other people or communities and cultures holding us responsible for things, All people have forsaken the light and sprinted for the shadows. And this is the real state of things. It's not that we should just try to shake off the dross. We get to Christmas time and and reset before a new year. We're going to make a bunch of promises to keep for the next 12 months. Grit our teeth and muster up enough moral strength to abide by good things, the real state of things is that we are totally depraved. We are in darkness. We are darkness, and we crave darkness. And this is the human condition. This is true for all people who ever have lived and ever will live. Merry Christmas. So why would I want to make this point today Why might I see this as such a critical thing to establish in order for us to point to how we celebrate Christmas differently and better than the whole world can? 
It's not to discourage you. It's not out of a dismal Charlie Brown sense of pessimism. It's far from it. It's to put a spotlight on the mercy of God in Christ Jesus at Christmas. Luke chapter 1, verse 76 through 79. This is being spoken of John the Baptist, who would come before Jesus as the one who is to prepare the way of the Lord. It says this of him. And you, child, John, will be called the prophet of the Most High, For you will go before the Lord to prepare His ways, to give knowledge of salvation to His people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace." This would be like someone tapping a man who was taking a nap out under the stars and asked him to get up and move 10 feet over. might be just kind of confused until you told him that he was napping on the rails and a giant train was coming down. If you don't know what you are being rescued from, then there's nothing to celebrate in the rescue. There's nothing to be grateful for. There's no need for Christmas if there's nothing to be rescued from. If everyone really is good on the inside, what need would we have of Jesus? And what need would we have for Christmas at all? Do you you see now that if a person doesn't see that they are dead in their sins and trespasses, separated from God because of their iniquities, and they have not seen that they are rightly under the wrath of God, both now and in eternity, for their wickedness of loving anything else more than Him, how Christmas will be kind of meaningless? Do you see then also how it might be almost folly for us to demand that that person acknowledge Christmas rather than holidays? It doesn't make sense. Christians celebrate that we have been undeservedly rescued from the darkness. Colossians 1, 13 says of Jesus, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of His beloved Son. 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for His own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of Him who called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. This is all over the New Testament. We all want the feel-good Christmas, don't we? In fact, if you're like me, you don't even care to watch the news this time of year. But when you see all the evil in the world, when you do see that stuff, and when the Christmas season ends and the impeachment trials continue and an election year goes on and wars and terror all around the world come to your ears again, let it remind you just how precious was his rescue. The world celebrates Christmas By saying that if you have been mostly nice and not naughty, you can be worthy of a gift. But our gospel is that God saves unworthy sinners. Isn't it crazy sometimes how worldly celebrations of things slowly drift further and further from the gospel and what they say? Isn't it exactly the opposite? All of us are on the naughty list. All of us deserving much worse punishment than coal, and yet we have been given the greatest possible gift. And we proclaim this gospel to the world. The Apostle Paul, talking about how Jesus converted his heart on the road to Damascus and set him on a mission to proclaim the gospel to lost Gentiles, says this in Acts 26. he, He proclaimed the gospel to people to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God. 
that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. The first reason that we celebrate Christmas differently than the world is we know that we need a Savior. Second reason today, what we celebrate as Christians that the world cannot celebrate on Christmas is the sovereignty of God. We celebrate the sovereignty of God over his creation, that God can and does enter into creation, that he really does work all things according to the counsel of his will. The kind of sovereignty that I'm talking about here is the kind of sovereignty that all Christians can eagerly celebrate together. A.W. Tozer, Christian author and one of my favorite authors, one of my favorite books, wrote this about the great power of God, the all-powerful nature of Him and His sovereignty, omnipotence, His all-power. He says this about these two things. Sovereignty and omnipotence must go together. One cannot exist without the other. To reign, God must have power, and to reign sovereignly, He must have all power. You ever thought about this is one of the things we celebrate about Christmas? We celebrate the sovereignty of God, that he was able to pull this thing off. In other words, for us, when we read the Christmas story, we don't wipe the sweat off our brow and say, "Woo, that was a close one. It's a good thing that everything worked out just right, coincidentally. It says in Galatians 4, 4 through 5, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. What an interesting phrase. When the fullness of time had come. You see what that implies? That there were things being worked out that culminated at the perfect moment in which Jesus should arrive on the scene. God didn't settle for a that'll work moment. For Christmas, he knew exactly Because he planned exactly what were to happen in Jesus' coming. There was nothing accidental. There was nothing even coincidental about Jesus' birth. We see God's hand moving all the pieces into place at multiple levels in this story, don't we? Shepherds and an innkeeper, foreign dignitaries, Local magistrates, the highest political power of the land, even the individual actions of a Nazarene carpenter and his fiancée. God was working all things out for his mighty purpose. Look what God did on Christmas. These are the things that we remember, that when we do Christmas pageants and we watch uh, nativity stories and when we read the the story to our children and we, we think about the events, we look at a nativity scene and we see all the characters present there. If you you stop to consider what's really taking place there that we acknowledge in our celebration of Christmas that the world just kind of looks at as a cute story. God ordained that Jesus would be born in Israel among his old covenant people during a period of great distress. Jesus could have been born anywhere, but God had long since planned that he would come in the biological bloodline of the Israelites, namely that of King David. He came during a period of great distress. In fact, there wasn't quite a period like it previous to it. Previous periods of great distress were ones where they were brought into exile. The Israelites were brought out of their own nation. When the corporate body of Israel did not live in Israel, and oftentimes were treated quite well, much better than should be expected in those situations, even ranking to high levels of government, being protected by kings. This is when the people lived in Israel without a king and yet under great oppression by national leaders. It's a unique time. God ordained that Jesus would be born to a people longing for a king. A national king for Israel was a temporary plan. The promised forever David king that was promised and prophesied in the Old Testament 
is more than merely a national hero or leader. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The people of Israel at that time were aching for an earthly king to help break the yoke of bondage under the Roman oppressors. They were crying out for a king. This is why in Jesus' life, multiple times, the crowds of people tried to make him a king. They had something particular in mind. They were crying out for it. They were aching for a king. And God sent the king. This was not the period of time like the judges where every man did what was right in his own eyes. This was not like those periods of history where they did not want a king. It was like a period of history where they did want a king. God ordained that Jesus would be born to a virgin. This is a supernatural birth. A marking of a kind that would say, God alone has his hand in this. It's different, and yet he's one of us. Only through this way could God and man be one in Jesus at his birth. Not only that, but this virgin just happened to be in the biological line of David. God ordained that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. All these things were spoken of in the Old Testament. And they weren't spoken of because he just figured out by looking into history, oh, I guess he'll be born in Bethlehem. Let's tell the prophets now. It was a plan that he would be born in David's hometown. Even though Joseph and Mary were from Nazareth, he determined that Caesar himself would order a census of the kind that demanded people to travel to their place of family heritage. Do you see how much is being worked out here? I had the great privilege of visiting the Holy Land, visiting Israel a couple of years ago. And perhaps one of the greatest things I took away from that trip was when we visited the city of Bethlehem, which is not far from Jerusalem. On our particular trip, just prior to going to Bethlehem, we visited another great historical site very close, about three miles away from there, called the Herodium. It was built just a decade or so before the birth of Jesus by Herod the Great. It was built on the highest peak in the Judean desert, and it was a giant palace. In fact, at the very top of it, where he'd put his palace, there were four towers that were each seven stories tall. So here's literally the image. Jesus, born in a stable, in the shadow of a giant palace from the ruling authority in the area. The king of kings born in a stable when the king who set himself over all the nation of all the land was in his palace. I remember thinking that that to me was such a, oh my goodness, God ordained that that palace would be there, that the shepherds would be passing that giant behemoth as they went to the stable to see the real king of kings, the real lord of lords. Perhaps this is why the angels, when they proclaim what the shepherds will find, they say that the Son of God has come. They tell them that Emmanuel is with you. They say that you're going to go see him. This will be a sign to you. He'll be a little baby in a, in a feeding trough for animals wrapped in cloths. That's a sign because it's totally different than anyone would have expected. And God ordained that all those things would happen just like that. God ordained that in Jesus' infancy, he would be able to identify with Old Testament Israel. We have a little baby right now. She's, what, 10 months old. She doesn't do anything she wants. Well, that's not true. She's starting to do things she wants. But we take her everywhere she goes. Every trip, we determine when it's time to put her down and what we're going to feed her and all those kind of things. Babies don't get to make those choices. Before Jesus was able to talk or walk or crawl. There are a number of things that happened in his young life to help him identify with Old Testament Israel. I want to think about this. We're in the book of Hebrews as a church studying through that right now. We just got to chapter 3. In chapter 3, the author compares Jesus with Moses. And the significance of that comparison runs deeper than Gentiles like you and me often realize. Moses was the Old Testament deliverer of God's people, the one who God used to redeem the people out of bondage, just like Jesus. 
Moses miraculously, in his infancy, escaped infanticide. Just like Jesus. And just like the Israelites in Moses' day, Jesus was brought out of Egypt. Jesus was taken by Joseph and Mary, told in a dream to go down to Egypt as he was being pursued to be killed by Herod. Goes to Egypt and Jesus comes out of Egypt, just like the rest of the Israelites did. So many things happened to Jesus in his infancy that were planned by God so that Jesus would be shown to be the only true, faultless, and faithful Israelite. Without God's intervening in history, we would be utterly helpless. We are entirely dependent on our sovereign, omnipotent God for help. I wonder if you've ever seen the movie Elf. It's a Christmas tradition for our family to watch this movie. Spoiler alert, but it's on you by this point if you haven't seen it. The big problem in the movie is that the world is full of people who no longer believe in Santa. And unless the people believe, he is powerless to deliver the presents. Christmas, then, is utterly dependent upon the collective belief of the people. Now, that's just a fun movie. But for many people, this is how they view God. A kindly, old, benevolent, cosmic Santa Claus who is only as powerful as our belief in Him. And that dependence from God to us is so real for many people that they would say that if they don't believe in God, He doesn't exist. But at Christmas, we celebrate that God is in control. And if there's ever a faltering of our faith, if there's ever a moment of doubt on our behalf, it in no way inhibits the greatness of our all-powerful God. He can and does save lost sinners, and He will bring us home to live with Him forever, just as He promised. When we celebrate Christmas, we are acknowledging God's power and His sovereignty to work all things according to the purpose of His will. Christians celebrate Christmas differently than the world because we celebrate that Christ's coming is for the joy of the world. There aren't any other Christmas stories that give you joy the way that the real Christmas story can. Sure, we can be excited to watch Bing Crosby and Danny Kaye dance across a stage and sing age-old tunes that we know and love, but nothing can bring joy like the greatest gift God ever gave. Look what it says in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. And in the same region where Jesus was born, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, And the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. When I was growing up, Christmas morning... We'd have presents around the tree. We'd come down. Uh, We kind of had a family tradition, uh, like I think probably many of you might. uh, We all had to stay upstairs and weren't allowed to sneak down to see the presents until everybody woke up together, and then we'd all go down at one time. That was how we did it in the Sanford home. And I remember pretty distinctly, there were two kinds of gifts as I could catalog them in my young mind. The gifts that we needed and the gifts that we wanted So the gifts that we needed were the socks and the new toothbrush. We were grateful. We always said thank you to mom and dad. But which gifts do you think I got excited for? The drum set with the paper heads and the real sticks. Those are the ones we most enjoyed. Not just the ones we needed, but the ones we wanted I broke that drum set before the end of that day. But I used the toothbrush pretty much every day for the next six months. But which do we get more joy out of? The one we wanted. 
If you're a gift-giving kind of family, if that's part of your family traditions on Christmas and, and people have prodded you for a Christmas list and have forced you to think beyond your grocery list to something that you just want, you might be kind of excited about opening that this coming Christmas. There's nothing wrong with that. But Jesus is coming, Jesus' birth, Jesus being gifted to the world was for our greatest joy. He was what we needed and what we wanted. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. He's a gift to the world. That whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. You might not have quite realized what an amazing gift he is. I think it's possible that just because a person is converted, they have not yet fully expected or been expected to behold all the beauties of Jesus. But as you grow with him, you will see this more and more and more. There is no greater gift than him. And your desire and love for him will grow and grow and grow as you are sanctified. This is why we sing joy to the world. It's not just thank you, Lord, for sending us what we needed soberly and somberly. God has so much more in mind than our momentary pleasure, forgetting the thing that we thought we wanted most. All things work together for His glory and our greatest joy. There, there are things that we know, we can say, Christians have believed in unison throughout church history. But there are some things that in our own language have been firmed up even just hundreds of years ago. I'm thinking of the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism where it asks the pivotal starting point question. What is the chief end of man? And the answer is and has been for hundreds of years. Man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. This eternal joy is to be offered, not just to national Israel. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. It will be to people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. Isn't that awesome? When we share the gospel with people, we are not trying to convince them to worship our tribal deity so that our God will receive more than he would have without their worship. We are offering people eternal joy. Nothing can fill you with joy more than this great gift of Jesus. He's not just this what you needed. There's nothing. If you can see with clear eyes, if you can have the veil of the old covenant, the system of laws and legalism, if you can have that removed from your eyes, if you can have the lies of deception in the world that things are better than the one who made the things, you can see he is the greatest gift that there is. When Mary was told she would give birth to Jesus, she was surprised, but would shortly thereafter travel to go visit her relative Elizabeth, who was pregnant with John the Baptist. And the book of Luke records this account where Mary goes to see Elizabeth, and when she gets close enough that Elizabeth sees her, John the Baptist, infant baby in the womb, leaps for joy <laughs> in the presence of pre-born Jesus. And Elizabeth calls Mary blessed. And this is what Mary does. She, she does what you'd expect her to do. She sings. She sings this song that we call the Magnificat. It has been called that for centuries in the church. Magnificat is Latin for my soul magnifies the Lord. And she begins that song like this. This is in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 through 48. Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. 
For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. She says that her spirit rejoices in God, her Savior. Zechariah and Elizabeth respond the same way, as did the shepherds in the field when they hear from the angels. They praised God and they glorified Him after they saw the baby Jesus. Joy poured out of all of those who were involved. When we celebrate the coming of Jesus, it's not just a stoic recognition of a past event. Nothing greater has ever happened for us. We reap benefits of His birth every single day, now and forever. Jesus' coming was for our great joy. The reformer Martin Luther wrote this about how the world can so easily miss the magnificence of what Christmas is all about. He points to this all the way back to the first Christmas. As though we should not think it any surprise that we might miss it today, just like they missed it then. He says this. When they, Mary and Joseph, arrived at Bethlehem, they were the most insignificant and despised. No one noticed or was conscious of what God was doing in that stable. He lets the large houses and costly apartments remain empty, lest lets their inhabitants eat, drink, and be merry, but this comfort and treasure are hidden from them. Oh, what a dark night this was for Bethlehem that was not conscious of that glorious light. See how God shows that he utterly disregards what the world is, has, or desires, and furthermore, that the world shows how little it knows or notices what God is, has, and does. I know that there are so many people that you know in your life, as I do in mine, who put up trees and lights, who buy presents and ornaments, who sing the carols, who have the parties, who celebrate with family and friends on the 25th of December, but they've never truly celebrated Christmas. Let us pray that by God's great mercy, those we love will be able to truly celebrate Christmas with us, hopefully now, and if not now, someday. Let's pray. Lord, we we need your help to wake us to these realities. Father, I know that as we prepare to worship you right now and sing in response to these things, we may need help in our hearts to even worship you, to sing joy, To the Lord, to the the world, the Lord has come. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Father, I pray that that would be so real for us, that that would come so much a reality for us that we couldn't stop ourselves from letting it bubble out. Lord, let us proclaim this glory to the world. Let Let us proclaim the magnificence of Christmas to the people around us. Let us teach our children rightly. Let us acknowledge it for ourselves. Father, I ask again, as I I do all month long, and as I will be all month long for the people at this church, Lord, that you would help us to be relieved from these distractions that might serve to draw us away from you and help us to leverage them to point us back to you. Lord, help us to be a people who has our eyes fixed on you. Lord, help us to remember that we celebrate your sovereignty in bringing your perfect son, Jesus, into this world. Help us to remember that it is for great joy of the world that you did this. And Lord, help us to remember that we, we being such a lost and unworthy people, undeserving of this good gift, have received it because of your great and tender mercy. We love you, Lord, and we ask you to help us to worship you this month for these things. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Please stand where you are and we'll continue singing this morning.